the mob bosses were already too late. The heat was just about to arrive. The Sicilian Mafia was making billions of dollars a year trafficking heroin into the US. For American crime fighters, it was time to break the Sicilian gangs. It was a fight that took place on the streets, led by men like DEA agent Frank Panessa. Panessa worked deep undercover. Using an assumed surname, he had posed as a taxi driver to infiltrate crime operations in New York. He'd observed Sicilian gangsters from New York driving down to Philadelphia. When two Philadelphia mafiosi were arrested, Vanessa told them, go to jail or get me in with the Sicilians. Vanessa would have to calm the Sicilians into thinking he was a mafia godfather. The two informants that we had selected a restaurant in South Philly, which was a known mob hangout, and we went there for dinner with the Sicilians. I sat in between the two made Italian guys here in, in Philly, and when the food came out, they would serve me first. And so the Sicilians were looking at this. They, you know, they knew, men of honor, that I must be somebody. Panessa's targets were two Sicilian brothers, Paolo and Giovanni Laporta. This DEA surveillance footage, secretly shot outside a pizzeria in Philadelphia, shows them with Panessa. The first step was done. Panessa was in. Now his con took off. I told them I had an import-export company. And so when they would come down to visit, we would rent trucks, okay? And we'd have the uh, metallic stickums from the side of the trucks. And we would put them on the side of the trucks and it said, Prima Import-Export, Trevos, Pennsylvania. So when they pull into the parking lot, they would see my fleet of trucks. <laughs> And they thought, well, this must be a legitimate business. Panessa upped the ante. He said he also had an office in Germany, which they could use to funnel heroin into the U.S. Giovanni Laporta was eager to see it for himself. So the DEA arranged for their German counterparts to set up a branch of Panessa's phony business. In the airport, this big burly German comes up to me and hugs me and he says, Frank, so good to see you. I've never met him in my life, you know, and, and I introduced him. Uh, he introduced himself to uh, uh, Giovanni and we go out to this big Mercedes Benz that's outside. And he says, look what Frank got me for Christmas, you know, and we get into the Mercedes Benz and we drive to this company. That's Primo Imp Prima Import Export. We go in the door, and here's this young, blonde, free Fraulein comes up to me and hugs me. Says, Frank, so good to see you. Here are the cookies that you like. And she had a tray of homemade cookies. Vanessa's bold deception paid off. He had uncovered a massive criminal conspiracy. The Laporta brothers told Panessa that they could launder five million dollars a day. In other words, over one billion dollars a year. And their business was not just confined to heroin. The brothers told him they also controlled 75% of cocaine distribution on the East Coast. Paolo Laporta came down to Philadelphia and I met with him in one of the pizza shops and on the table was 30 kilos of cocaine and he says here take take a few kilos I said well you know I, I I'm not into that you know I'm doing the other stuff meaning the heroin and I'm, I'm not into the coke you know and Paolo I guess it was his son it was like a little six-year-old standing there and, and I said, I feel in a slang term, I said scumbari, which means I, you know, I felt itchy that the little kid was down here, you know, and looking at all this dope on the table. And so he said to the little kid, what do you see? 
And the kid in true mafia form said, I see nothing. <laughs> and that threw me for a loop. He, he was, uh, you know, mafia in training. <laughs> Vanessa secretly tracked the Laporta brothers for nine months as they ferried heroin between Sicily, New York and Philadelphia. Both men would eventually serve lengthy prison sentences. With such astonishing amounts of money at stake, Vanessa was in little doubt what his fate would be if he'd been discovered. Those who got out of line were murdered and their bodies disposed of. Gangster Henry Hill was a regular participant in operations to get rid of the Mafia's victims. We usually buried him. A few times we'd throw him in a fucking lot somewhere, uh, you know, just leave him in the cars and have him chopped up. And just bring the car down to the junkyard. Put two of them a couple of times in the, in, the, in the trunk and they get smashed and go to Japan and make ashtrays in. The easiest places to bury bodies was in our clubs, you know, in the basement, of course. <laughs> we, you know, we just dug the hole and right there and put the body in the lime and it, was, it would disappear in, you know, a matter of months. Forget about it. <laughs> This African-American church used to be a mafia bar run by a killer called Roy DeMeo. This was probably the most notorious um, bar in Brooklyn. It was the headquarters for the DeMeo crew. I'd say 70% of their murders were done at this location. You always were scared to be around this crew. Um, I don't care who you were. There was always a certain apprehension. In Sicily, terror was nothing out of the ordinary. Somewhere on the island lurked the man running the heroin trade to the US, the godfather of the Sicilian mafia, Toto Riina. Riina had murdered his way to the top of the Sicilian Mafia to seize control of the heroin trade to the US. Hundreds of people may have been killed on his orders. Few in Sicily had the courage to stand up to him. One who did was prosecuting magistrate Judge Giovanni Falcone. From his office in the Palace of Justice in Palermo, Falcone and a handful of brave colleagues waged a lonely and dangerous war against the Mafia. Help was about to arrive. In May 1982, the Italian government sent an army general to Sicily with orders to crush the Mafia. But not long after arriving, he was gunned down in the city center, his young wife by his side. Sicilians rose up in outrage. At their funeral, the coffins of the two victims were applauded. But outside the church, the politicians who attended the funeral were jeered and spat on blamed by ordinary Sicilians for tolerating the Mafia for so long. In response, the Italian government finally provided Falcone with the backing he needed. Liliana Ferraro was a long-standing friend and colleague in the fight against the Mafia. The Ministry of Justice in Rome sent her to see what Falcone needed. She was appalled at the conditions that Falcone worked in. The first thing I noticed was an old metal desk. 
There was a chair with a leg missing that was totally buried in paperwork. And a pile of files holding it all up. Giovanni said to me, this is our office. These are our tools. This is our model of efficiency. If you think you can manage here, then fair enough. Falcone set about his task of fighting Totoriina with renewed vigor. He was on the verge of a breakthrough. The net was closing in on two godfathers, both of them closely associated with Totoriina. It sparked a chain of events 